King's Seat Project, I see it as an ongoing story. The fort and the stronghold have been in that situation for well over a thousand years now, I understand. However, our wee bit has just taken the story forward. Can I make it clear that I am in no way an archaeologist, but merely an enthusiastic amateur and as such a member of the Dunkeld Burnham Historical Society, whose aims are to promote interest in and encourage the study of local history in our area. Members always try to identify projects of interest and I am no exception. At the beginning of November 2015, I was taking my morning walk with the dog along the tea near my home in Little Dunkel when I began to ponder the idea of creating a walk for tourists to Dunkel and Burnham, complete with maps showing particular points of interest. And in my mind, I had already identified the old oak the cathedral and other places. Mentally, as I walked, I was tracing this possible track and had reached Dunkeld House and thought of the King's seat. And then I had my Eureka moment and thought of Dunkeld itself, which I knew to be the fort of the Caledonians, Dunkeld, and the King's seat was that fort. Almost immediately, all thought of the tourist trail was dropped and Dunkeld, its fort and beginnings from ancient times became the focus. Being a local, I was well aware of the location of the fort on a heavily wooded knoll just outside Dunkeld, beside a Poolney Loch, and to my shame, I had not taken any great interest in it. I have to add, like most locals, it seems almost unbelievable, but it is still the case that local knowledge of this ancient site is still sparse, to say the least. Even after being in the public press and periodicals like the local bridge. Although with this project, this is changing. The next day found me and Doc up at Poolney Loch, trying to find a way up the sides of the knoll which even right away I could see was heavily invested with rhododendrons. Other woodlands, but rhododendrons were the worst. I managed to force my way through and around and up the bushes and eventually got to the edge of the top, but I found it to be completely covered by rhodes. There was no way in, I can guarantee you. The whole of the top was a real jungle, right to the edge of very steep sides and sheer escarpment in places. At that time, it was not possible to get a better photo as there was no place to stand off from it. If you're standing there, if you're up to the roadies, you're right against them, so no photo. No examination was possible. So, on the 4th of November 2015, I called at Perth Museum, thinking that they might have a resident archaeologist. No such luck, but they did advise me I should contact Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust. Same day, I called the trust and my response was immediate and enthusiastic. The young lady said she would advise David Strachan the trust manager of my interest, and she would send me papers which would be of help, and she did, right away, by email. Briefly, my reading showed that the site had been visited by an F.W. Feacham archaeologist, some of you may be aware of that man, I hadn't known him before. He'd been there in 1966 that he, like me, had been unable to access the site no digs had been done, but that it was a most promising sight. Other comments on the papers were to the effect that the fort appears to be reasonably intact, etc., and that material might well be found, including human remains. Well, as you might expect from an ex-cop, 
That got me even more excited. <laughs> but this time I was convinced I was on to something. And so I contacted members of the Historical Society on the 9th November, who agreed that we as a society should pursue hopeful examination of the fort. Same day, made a personal call on David Strachan at the Heritage Trust and outlined our proposals. That is, we, oblique I, would undertake to clear the site and we could hopefully go on to make a proper investigation under supervision. He was most helpful, as he has been throughout our association, with advice on contacting the landowner and itch yes for permission to dig, which he would do on my behalf. As you might expect, over the, next, over the subsequent few weeks, there was considerable toing and froing, making arrangements and getting various permissions, all of which fell into place. For myself, I had the rough idea of the basis of a squad capable of doing the work clearing the roadies. If you have not been there, the site of the fort is on top of a crag with sheer cliffs protecting it on two sides and very steep slopes elsewhere, all capped to the very edges by the aforementioned roadies. It was agreed between David Strachan and myself that it was only suitable for a very small squad to operate safely. And accordingly, I engaged my friends and former colleagues, Alistair Carter, Sandy Kay, Ian Dick, along with those identified by D. Strachan, who had helped at previous digs, namely Steve Ponsonby, Derek and Anthea Dean, and Dave Roberts, who you will hear from shortly, Secretary of the Historical Society. We waited for the winter to clear and for us to be clear of other ploys which we had afoot, namely pheasant shooting. <laughs> While we were waiting, my nose getting the better of me, I of course revisited the site on, on days when I was not working, trying to find a better route up it. In other words, how had the original inhabitants accessed it? As it was winter, and the leaves were off the trees. I was down at St. Combe's Well, which is at the foot of the crag, sure it would be the place where the inhabitants would get their water. Standing off from the face, I become aware of a very thin line of a track through the bare trees on a gentle gradient from the well up to the first level below the crag. This has now become our main route up. If there is a better one, I've not been able to find it. Now to the clearance. Work started on Monday the 8th February 2016 and continued on various days until 21st March. And we usually gave ourselves a rest day or days even in between. Looking at me, you will appreciate we were not all in the first flush of you, so we needed a rest. <coughs> That's us clear. Our method was simply that experienced men, and that's who I'd identified, would operate power saws, cutting the branches and the roots, and the others, me, and we toss the cuts over the edge to rot, just as simple as that. We started at what we thought had been the original entry gate to the upper fort and worked round the edges on a broad front of about six to ten paces, gradually working in to order the set towards the centre. I kept a log of our activities, that's why I can give you all the dates. And in all, it took us 103 hours of work until D. Strachan agreed the site was clear enough for a dig to begin. That's what we thrashed it down to. Over the next three years, that is 17, 18 and 19, 
For two weeks each September, the King's Seat archaeological dig has taken place. And I can only say, from a personal viewpoint, it has been fantastic. I have had the great pleasure of working with and been guided by David Strachan and his team at the Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust, and in addition, Andy Hale and Cathy McIver of AOC and the members of their team, who are the professionals in archaeology, having further guided us all, shown great patience and firmness <coughs> in the conduct of the dig, and enhanced our collective pleasure in being part of a great project. We have made very many finds of artefacts, which we have been assured are of importance. I'll let Dave Roberts, the Secretary of the Dunkeldon Burn Historical Society, take you through these. Thank you. Thanks, David. And I would say one advantage having an ex-cop on the uh, team was he kept a very good notebook of every single event that went on. <laughs> what I want to do is talk about, from my perspective, how the Society became involved in the project and how we worked with the Heritage Trust and others to bring the project to fruition. I also want to talk about the people involved in the project and then give an initial update on the excavation results. As David said, the whole project started when he wandered into the community archive in Dunkeld and the Historical Society was having a committee meeting and they wanted us to get involved. He was incredibly enthusiastic and infectious uh, with his interest. And when, because we were always interested in learning more about the history of the local area, we quickly became involved. We knew it was beyond our particular skills, so we contacted, as David's explained, Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust. And David Strack and Seven Malone were incredibly helpful to us. Things began to fall into place after I had a series of meetings with them. We made joint grant applications, sought the necessary permissions, which were very important. And David McDougall and his made a uh, band of men and women cleared the site. A while we sought funding, we also appointed AOC. There's a lot to say in detail, which we can answer questions on, about the early stages, but it's a superb example of putting a team together where we all recognised the contributions that each and every person could bring to the scheme. We all had strengths and we all had gaps in our knowledge. Following that, we then had three years for a fortnight every September where we excavated the site. We also had a living history fair. So we also had a living history fair which went on one year and things like this were very, very important to engender interest in it. The living history fair was organised by the Heritage Trust and we did a reenactment uh, in called Picks in the Park in the middle of Dunkeld. We had a reenactments we had the sound of Pictus Industries, we had uh, metalworking, casting, smithing, leatherworking, timber construction, stone carving. Uh, we had weapons demonstrations, which were great interest to many people. We had talks by project archaeologists and the AOC archaeology group, where the place name expert, Dr. Peter McNiven, who gave a lecture in the archive about the fascinating meaning about local names. It was opened by Dougie McLean, uh, the local uh, singer-songwriter you all know from his song Caledonia. And it really was a great way to start off the project. We had 600 people at the Living Fair, and that engendered a lot of interest in what was going on. Back to King's Seat, this is a site which David has already shown you. Um, we have an upper enclosure which is pointed out there very clearly. It's surrounded by a low wall. There's a mid-level terrace enclosed by banks on the west, and a lower terrace enclosed by a bank at the very bottom. <coughs> Someone talked earlier about strategies. We had to be very clear what we were trying to achieve in this particular project. We had a number of different aims, but essentially we wanted to establish the history of the site and how old was it. The rhododendron growth, which David has referred to, was quite significant, but we also wanted to understand how badly it disrupted the actual site and the layers on the site. I have to say it was absolutely essential that we use local volunteers, and this has been a great success but we also had great support from all the professional people who were working alongside us. And a wider aim was to see King's Seat not in isolation, but how it links to other sites throughout Scotland. This is a plan of the site showing the trench locations. We had permission only to dig seven, which were placed to investigate different parts of the site. 
including the cat, and this helps us try to understand the character and date of the banks and explore the interior of the terraces. <clears throat> we had a large and varied groups of volunteers on the site. Um, some people came every day, some came for uh, a whole week at a time. What is very important is to understand the value of volunteers. People have mentioned this earlier, but we had and we kept a log, as David's explained, of the hours volunteers spent. And we spent over 3,000 hours on site through the volunteers' time. And this is one thing funders don't recognise, is the importance of volunteers and the value they bring to projects. Um, right, OK. Um, we did lots of tours of the, um, of the site, and we had... Um, we involved lots of volunteers, etc. The one highlight for the project was the finding and um, recording workshops, which are held regularly. AOC experts held these at the end of each day, and it was absolutely fascinating to find out what had gone on on the site. These finds were really very exciting, and if people found them, we could share in the experience of what they were. I've mentioned the 3,000 volunteer hours, and th this was extremely valuable. This is an example of, of one of our volunteers excavating a site. Students. Um, we had our community students from different universities working with us. And one very good example is somebody who came as a volunteer and has now ended up doing a full-time UHI course on archaeology. It was very important to involve, involve schools. Um, we had children from early primary through to secondary school age involved in digging, sieving and site tours. And we had a total of 122 pupils uh, from different schools in Vidalbin, Pitlockery and the Royal School of Dunkeld. We had students on full-time work experience, which was absolutely essential to us. I'm conscious I've got uh, limited time, so I'll just show you some of the, um, the findings. I'm not an expert on this, but we have Cathy uh, and others from AOC here who can answer your detailed questions, and they certainly know what they're talking about. We have identified and confirmed the presence of enclosures on three terraces of the site, and these comprise of stone and soil banks with stone faces or curbs and some timber components, and we've dated these to around 435 and 642. On the top of the site is this amazing um, massive schist, glacial erratic, and uh, it's near the entrance to the site. And we wondered whether this could be the king's seat. We uncovered the bedrock, which is uh, shown uh, here. Uh, although it's heavily disturbed, you could see that there's some post holes in this, which we, very, we think might be very significant. This is an aerial view of, of the site. Uh, we had somebody who came along with a drone, which is extremely useful in, in overseeing this. I'm sorry I'm rushing through this, it's important to show you some of the findings. These are some of the, the halves that we found, and the halves show evidence of metal working, so it's, uh, and the halves from different parts of the site, so it's not just a one-off event. We had lots of finds um, on, the, on the site, and one of them was found by uh, our, uh, one of the first school groups come up, and this is a spindle well that somebody found. <clears throat> and there's different examples here of them used in textile production. And there's David again, in fact, he found one of these, so he's very chuffed with that. Very modest. <laughs> we also found what we think are slingshots. And they're very similar to ones found at Maiden Castle down in Dorset. And perhaps these were gathered to aid defence. And we found it absolutely fascinating coming across groups of artefacts like this. There's evidence of metalworking and we found some knife blades. There's also uh, evidence of pressure, uh, precious metalworking um, on, the, on the site. Um, there's a wee ceramic vessel and the metal would have been melted down over a hot fire. We found moulds, and some of these are at the back here if you want to see them later on today. We also found quite significantly 
evidence of high status pottery called e-ware. This was imported from the continent in the 7th century and is only found on very high status or royal sites. The pottery is thought to have come up the west coast and King's Seat is one of the most eastern sites that we have found this and again this is of I think great significance. We found vessels from drinking vessels and beads that you can see here. So to summarise, I'm sorry, I'll get it back. So which one is it? It's, uh, just go back about two or three. That, that'll be fine. Yes, yep. that's fine. So I'm going to try and summarise. The finds are spectacular. We found a lot of artefacts indicate a high status or royal site similar to those at Denard, in Kilmartin, Dundun, or Motive Mark in Dumfries and Galloway. And these are all high status centres for their regions in the early historic period. <clears throat> There's a lot of work to do, but we mustn't forget all the volunteers who've been involved at different stages in this example of just one day. There's more work to be done, including specialist analysis, more dating, publications, and getting the results of the project out to people throughout Scotland. What's significant is, is the funding that we got uh, from different sources and the number of different people that were involved. But from our perspective, I'd like to summarise in terms of the type of this uh, conference, that it's very important to work with professional archaeologists, to work with volunteers from many different backgrounds, and that we all learn together about our local heritage. It's also stimulating seeing visitors, especially school children, coming up and seeing the site and being fascinated about what's going on. We've also had academics who were intrigued about the finds, and they had their own theories. It even made Melvin Braggs in our time. So it's a very exciting and worthwhile project. In terms of the theme of this conference, I think we've demonstrated this in giving King's Seats a history and giving all the volunteers and local people who've been interested in the site a real connection with it. In terms of going forward, we're looking at how we can tie in King's Seat to the many walks and trails and history of this local area. But none of this would have happened without the volunteers, David's vision here, and the uh, professional support from people like the archaeologists who are here today. I'd like to pay tribute to everybody who's been involved in this. Thank you. <laughs>